Okay. Slides here. And we are recording. Excellent. So can everyone see the slides there? So the um, the goal, at least the, for this portion of the meeting, um, was to get from some input from the working group on, on a number of questions um, that will then inform the, the Valley Green Energy communities as they, they move towards um, launching the program. To give a, a tiny bit of background, um, the program plan has now been approved by the Department of Public Utilities. So the next question, the next step, next major step is to run a competitive procurement for an electricity supplier. Um, that's all being scheduled. And as part of that, a number of the key program decisions get made. They're reflected in the contract between the towns and the suppliers. And so the purpose today is to talk through some of those key questions um, to get the working group's perspective on them. So I made a list of questions here. It's not meant to be exclusive. There may be other questions you wish to discuss, but just to get us started, um, I thought it would be useful to talk about the type of any additional RECs, the percentage of additional RECs in the standard green product, which is a default product, um, a question of how to create the 100% the green option, what gets counted in that 100%. Um, and then whether to offer a local option at program launch, uh, and if so, the makeup of that option. So that's just an initial set of questions, and I'll walk through some slides, and then we'll, we can circle back um, to the questions later and talk about whether there are other questions to look at. Um, so just as by way of background, um, most folks are quite familiar with all this, but just as a reminder, um, the Valley Green Energy Aggregation Plan provides that the program will offer at least three options. One is standard green, which is the default, which folks get unless they pick one of the others. Um, and that will have some amount of additional renewable electricity, but the exact percentage of that will be determined as part of the supply contract. Um, then there'll be a 100% green opt-up option for folks who want that. And then similarly, there'll be a 100%, there'll be a basic option with no additional electricity for folks who want that. The, 100% green would cost more than the standard and the basic would cost less. Um, also, the plan provides that Valley Green Energy may also offer a fourth option, which would be called the local option, which would have renewable electricity from local generators. And we'll talk about that. That was included in the plan as something that you might do at launch, but mm, you also might not do it at launch, but introduce it, introduce it later on. So we're, one of the first things we're going to look at is the amount of additional renewable energy in the standard product. And just to help think about that, I have a graph here of the amount of additional um, renewable energy in the standard products of other, um, I think all communities in Massachusetts that have additional renewable energy in their standard. And you can see it's quite a range. Um, Newton is at the top end with 70%. Um, and the Cape Light Compact is down at the bottom with 1%. Um, you roughly in the middle is 10% extra with half the towns at 10% or less and half the towns with 10% or uh, with more than 10% rather. Well, that's just a way of, of grounding this uh, discussion. Um, so the next thing we have here, and we can really dig in on it here, is this table illustrates how the product price gets built up and what are the what are the components and how they might add together and also what you'd get compared to. So let me take a minute just walking us through this. So the table at the top shows the prices at various levels of additional voluntary RECs in the standard product. Uh, so we just for illustration here, we have 5, 10, 15, and 20. Um, the first row, or the row right behind that, is the base price for electricity. That's what includes all, all the RECs that's required, but no more. Um, this would be the price in this illustration uh, for the basic product. And then we would layer on top the cost of the additional RECs, which is in that next row, um, which is in the light green. That 
row there 13.5, that would be that number will be established based on the bids we receive from suppliers. Um, this isn't um, you know, an actual number, it's not based on actual bids, it's just an illustration. Um, you know, not an unrealistic illustration, but nonetheless just an illustration um to show what what the town could expect or that what Valley Green Energy could expect. Um, and then, so we take the base price of electricity, we add the cost of RECs at whatever level you choose, and that gets to a total price down below. Now, the total price um, typically gets compared to the utility basic service price, and the utility basic service prices are in that, is in that table in the lower left. Now, what's um, challenging for you is that um, Valley Green is actually served by two different utilities. Um, Northampton is in National Grid territory, uh, but Amherst and Pelham are in the Wamiko territory. And the Wamiko basic service price is noticeably less than the, nor than the National Grid basic service price. It's also the case that basic service prices are coming down. So the current price through the end of July, if we look at National Grid as an example is over 18 cents. Um, their new price starting in August will be at 16 cents, so down noticeably from there. So those things put um, put some constraints probably, or at least hurdles for the amount of additional recs Valley Green might want to offer. Um, it's it's typical for communities to offer a price where the standard product, including the additional RECs, is a tiny bit less than the basic service price. Um, we do have experience with one, one community, or you can think of two, uh, one that didn't have a basic product and just launched with a price, including the additional RECs that was higher than basic service. Um, that wasn't a very popular path and that community caused a lot of controversy. Um, we also have experience with another community that's thought, well, we have a basic product and the basic product is below basic service. So we can launch with a standard product above the basic service price as, lo as long as we're offering separately a basic price, a basic product that's lower. Um, we found there too that that produced a much higher than typical opt-out rate of the program that one would think that customers would look at all the prices on the page. They would consider, see that they had a lower price to offer option in the basic and do that rather than opt out of the program. But um, that wasn't the experience so much. And we did have a, a pretty solid opt out rate there or how much higher than usual opt out rate. Um, and then I'm going to be quiet and let folks talk in a second, but I just wanted to offer one other thing. So, um, uh, a while ago, um, you know, Darcy circulated the launch prices from the Belchertown aggregation, which were really quite attractive, where all the products they offered were below the basic service price. Um, the reasons that that's not, unfortunately, an option for us here are a few. Um, the main one is that Belchertown is a national grid community, not a Lamico community. So they didn't have to deal with that lower Lamico price. They also launched when the national grid price was up at 18 rather than where it currently is or is about to be at 16. Um, and then finally, and this is actually the least of the least impact, um, market electricity prices were a little bit lower when Belchertown went out to bid. They were lucky they caught the low point in the market several months ago. The prices are a little bit higher now. Um, but the bigger factors are National Grid rather than Lamico and those higher basic service prices, which are, which are coming down. Um, so that's a lot of talking by me. Why don't I um, ask if folks have comments or questions on what we've looked at so here. Okay, do you want to um, leave this slide up? People want yeah, to raise I, their hands. I think that would make sense because there's a lot on this one and mm -hmm. this is the main point for talking about this topic, so. Okay, so if anyone has a question, please raise your hand.
Okay, Ben. Um, so I, I I'm new here, so I I am I may be missing things that uh, have already been explained early in this process. So I apologize if that's the case, but I'm really interested in the guarantee of additionality associated with these wrecks, um, given that. Um, you know, there's there's a the RPS gov governing uh, kind of the, the basic direction of the wrecks, and um, the the concern that the price you see as a producer uh, is related to the spot market, um, and that this is a a small addition, but essentially renewables producers tend to have the lowest value energy in at in the five minute market or so forth so it's just a question of just like how do we understand the additionality associated with these wrecks yes so i mean that's that's a that's a great question and um um and one that most aggregations grapple with um the additionality so let me explain what these wrecks are and then what the additionality argument is for them and this is the 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 strategy here would be to buy unbundled uh, class one wrecks. You're just buying class one wrecks, which is what the strategy that pretty much every aggregation implements so far. But it's not a perfect one from additionality perspective. Um, they're class one, so that means they count as new under the RPS definition, but they're existing facilities, or you couldn't buy their wrecks. So. You're not directly causing the construction of a new renewable project. You're really buying RECs from a project that's already there. And that's the way it works. The additionality argument for that is that by buying these additional RECs over and above what's required, um, you're helping to create a market demand for more renewable energy. And that market demand will lead to the construction of more renewable projects in the future. Um, you know, much like, you know, people buy iPhones. What does that do? Well, it creates a demand for more iPhones. So suddenly there are a whole lot more iPhones available. So it's that kind of market-based argument that supports the additionality claim. It's not as direct, though, as, for example, a contract with a new project. Um, and for that reason, you um, the the state has actually started to you'd say this in favor of buying additional recs, but they've actually started to encourage aggregations to also consider um, collecting a fee through the aggregation, which is something that Valley Green Energy plans to do anyway, and then using that to invest directly in new projects. So if you do that, the additionality um, argument is much stronger because you're directly investing in something new. Um, the challenge to it is it takes longer because you don't start out with a whole bunch of money. You got to collect it over time and it's a more complicated thing to do. But um, the state has really quite recently shifted to saying that's actually the best thing you could be doing. And maybe you ought to consider that in addition to buying the, the, those unbundled wrecks or buy fewer of those unbundled wrecks and put more into new projects. This will circle into that local option discussion we're going to have later, but that's the that's the additionality discussion. Ben, did that answer your question? Yeah. Um, so you confirmed that, that it's unbundled recs, and it's not part of this discussion to consider bundled recs, or it's or is it? <laughs> yeah. So that that's you could buy bundled recs although it's much harder and a little bit more expensive to do it. I would argue though, there's not really any additional, uh, there's not any more additionality from a bundled rec than an unbundled rec because it's still from an existing project. So it ties the power to the rec at the source rather than tying the power to the rec like at the consumer, which is what happens when you buy unbundled. But from additionality perspective, it's not really any different. So most people, the people who've looked at that have decided, well, buying the bundled wrecks doesn't really get us anything more about in what we really care about. So it's not worth to us. It isn't the worth the, the additional cost of doing that. Great. Agreed. But on the same page.
I see Tom, you have, Tom has his hands up. Do you, do you want to go ahead, Tom? I was waiting for Stephanie to give me the thumbs up, but yes. Uh, and very helpful question, Ben. Um, we haven't met. Hello. I'm, I'm Tom from Pelham here. Um, uh, so just to kind of, um, I, I need you to repeat um, what you said. You had a history lesson about um, what drove more people to opt out than normal. Um, and I guess wrapped around that is like it, it feels to me like in spite of the declining price from the incumbent suppliers, we're, you know, it's still good news that we can offer an opt in provision that will save uh, residents money. Um, am I reading that right? And and then um, I guess the other part of the history that I'm trying to understand is, is if you look back in time, how have CCA standard uh, CCA offers compared to the incumbent utility offers? Have people regretted it or been happy that they've done it when they look back on it? Oh, so to address that second question first, um, in the vast majority of cases, I, CCA programs have offered prices that are lower than utility basic service. Right. Um, or as you know, we're, we can't promise savings for the future because the basic service price changes all the time. But if we learn backwards, there have been savings in almost every case and even where there are additional recs in the, the standard product. So mm -hmm. generally speaking, it's been a, a good, very good um, proposition for residents from both an environmental and a cost perspective. There are certainly times where those um, CCAs that have been very aggressive in their additional recs end up being above basic service. So there's certainly time when Newton is higher than basic service and those other town, you know, communities that are way up there, Acton, Worcester, a couple others that are up, you know, like 20, 30, 40 percent extra. Um, the communities that have stuck with a slightly less aggressive additional recs in the five ten percent or slightly more range, they've been more consistently below. But big picture, they've all been below and and saved money. Excellent. I mean, it is interesting that a smaller aggregation of customers can get a better price than the bigger aggregation, which I'm assuming is what the incumbent utility is shopping for. I, I don't know if you have any comment on that. I'm happy to see the results. I know it'll be very helpful. So, but, but that's my only other thought. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's certainly the case. Are you saying like basic service is bigger, so they ought to get a better price? Just, just on simple supply demand right. uh, negotiating. Yeah. Right. It's a, that's a fair point. And, and interestingly, like, although bigger purchasers generally get better prices ac across the economy and all sorts of things in electricity, that's not so much true. Once you're the size of a town, you know, certainly a town can do better than an individual resident. Um, but once you're the size of a town, the size isn't the driver. I mean, we often see, for example, um, smaller communities get better prices than Boston does very yeah. often. And it has to do with the nature of the load when you use electricity, how expensive it is at those times when the community uses most of its electricity. That's more of a driver than size. Hmm. And then if you look at basic service in particular, basic service carries some risks that aggregation programs don't. So although it's it's actually surprising that aggregations could consistently beat basic service, that has been the that has been the experience. Um, but again, we can't promise the future and the reasons to think the two prices would be in the end pretty similar. Very helpful. Thanks, Paul. Additional questions? Okay, I'm not seeing anybody raise their hand, so. Um. Oh, go ahead, Andra. I, I wonder if we could look at the um, comparison of the aggregations again. Sure. Oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. This one? Yes. I'm curious where Cambridge is, because we just talked so with... Cambridge, um, 
they may not be on here because of course they, sh they should be on here now. So historically, Cambridge actually didn't include additional recs in their standard product. What they did instead was they actually collected an adder and they used it to build the solar project in the, in the, in the city. That had been their approach. They did just with their new contract did start to add additional recs. So had I updated this, I would have put them on the list. I can't recall what the percentage is, but I'm wondering if, if Marlena or Kim remembers what the percentage is in Cambridge. I think it's about 20, 24%, 25%. But certainly it's in there in the 20s somewhere. It's in the yeah. 20s. In the upper half of the graph. Yeah, they, they went to 50% class one. So whatever that is for each year. Right. So that's why it's like the 20, yeah, 24%. So that, that to explain that, so that's 50%, including the required amount of class one. So required is 24% this year. So that would be 26% extra next year. We'll drop that. Okay. Darcy. I'm just wondering, you know, looking at the prices, the sample prices that you listed, it looked like we would not be able to, um, you know, charge more than 10% and save if this ended up to be actual bids. And I'm just wondering about that chart of all the of all the communities, half of them are charging 10% or less, and half of them are charging more than 10%. Does that mean all those communities that are uh, have more than 10% additional recs are, uh, are costing their customers additional money for their standard offering? Um, good question. No, what it mostly means is that they're not in the Wamiko service territory. So Wamiko has consistently the lowest basic service price of any of the utilities. And Wamiko is pretty small for the state. So it's just a small pocket of the state. The vast majority of customers are in National Grid or Eversource East, where basic service prices tend to be higher. So there's more room in those for those communities to add additional recs um, than there is for uh, communities in the Wamiko territory. Okay, thank you. Ben? Uh, so I have a question about the, uh, this concept of collecting a fee and then building your own, um, which I find appealing. One issue I'm curious about are how how is it how are we affected by the fact that we are in two different service territories? So you know, one national grid, one Miko, uh, potentially different load zones. Uh, what happens to benefits? Uh, you know, collective benefit of that uh, new new construction. Mm -hmm. So that's an in, that that's an interesting question too, and. I'll give my initial thought, but I probably should think about it a little bit more. But I, my initial thought is it it wouldn't make so much of a difference. So what typically happens and, you know, an ex would be an example with the Cambridge project um, and others is you would you build a solar project. You would typically just sell the electricity into the market at whatever the market price is. Um, and that might vary a little bit depending on where it is. So what you would expect to return from that. And then you would take the recs and you would retire those for the benefit of the aggregation. And recs are indifferent as to utility service territory. Okay, Tom. Uh, just along, kind of along the same lines as uh, um, we're just being asked, but the pricing you're showing here does not have our adder factored into it. Yeah, so that's a really good question. So it doesn't, although those 13, that 13.5 is just kind of a rounded off number anyway. So it's not all that precise, but the way we would have you think about 
real numbers when there are real bids as we we would I mean, we would ask, but confirm you want to collect that ad or that goes into the base price because everybody pays that and then the rec price would be on top. So I'll, I'll admit I wasn't thinking about the adder when we put these numbers together, but it's also in the rounding anyway. No, that's why we have this call, right? So, um, but, and can you refresh? I remember we did the calculation back in the Chris Mason days, but if we put a, a mill on there, a 10th of a penny, how, do you know how many kilowatt hours we're bidding in? What would that amount to? Yeah, so we did do that estimate. It'll take me a second to um, yeah. pull it up. I I, um, I don't know if I can do that without taking the slides down. It's it's on the order of a little over a hundred grand a year, I think. Okay, that's um, close enough for this meeting, I think. Oh, if Just... when we're done with, I don't want to like take the slides down, put them back up, and make you all dizzy. But I'll confirm that before we get off the call. My rec recollection was that it was somewhere around one hundred and thirty thousand. Right. Yes, that that's, that sounds right, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Comments? Questions? Okay, I think we can continue, Paul. Excellent. Thanks, Stephanie. So, I think my next question. Um, is how you get to 100% green for your 100% green option. And there are at least two different ways that you can do that. And this is, I'm glad we're having this discussion with this group because it's it's kind of mind numbing. So when it comes up, um, sometimes with folks who aren't like in the weeds here, it's like more weeds than they wanna deal with, but it's an important question for people who care. So one way to think of 100% is to think it's 100% class one recs. And so then what you do is you take the required amount of class ones, let's say 24% that's in your base price, and you buy 76 extra, and that gets you to a 100% class one product. And that's what we've illustrated on the left. The other way to do it is to get to 100% renewables. And the reason that's different is because the state RPS isn't just class one, you know, it requires all sorts of other things as well. So there's class two, there's the clean energy standard, there's the waste to energy requirement, there's a whole bunch of stuff. And so if you include all the extra stuff as renewable to get to 100, you only need to buy about, you know, 30% extra or 32% extra class ones rather than 75% extra class ones. So it makes the increment additional cost less. Um, I'll say that the, the downside to the second approach that I discussed going to 100% renewable counting everything that the state counts is that not everything that the state, some people feel like not everything that the state counts is all that desirable. So for example, the state counts waste to energy, which is arguably renewable, but it's also a very, very highly polluting. So maybe you don't want to count that. The state also counts nuclear. Well, it's not renewable, but it's zero carbon. So there are all sorts of resources in there. What we found is more communities that are really more sort of greener and environmentally focused tend to gravitate towards the 100% class one product where it's cleaner, renewable, it's easy enough to explain, um, the, or it's a, it's, a more, it's a more clean thing. The only downside to that is in your opt-out notice and other things, you need to report the total amount of renewables, including voluntary and the required, which puts you to a total of over 100% for renewables, which can be a little mind bending. Um, you know, I will say, you know, athletes have been given 110% for years. So I don't know why we couldn't have more than 100% renewables, but it, it is, a, it can be a, a little bit confusing to have more than 100%. So that, that's really the choice. Do we want 100% class ones, which means we have more than 100% total or do you want 100% total, which means some of what we're counting isn't really all that clean or isn't really renewable? Adele? I thought we had already 
decided that we only wanted to purchase Massachusetts class one Rex. I, I, so if, if we already had this conversation, Adele, I apologize for bringing it up again. I think maybe what we <laughs> talked about before was for your extra recs, what would they be? And I think we talked about for the extra, the additional recs, should those be only class ones or should they be some other type? And I do remember we had, we, there was conversation there was strong sentiment towards for the extra ones only by class ones. This is a similar or related, but slightly different perspective, which is assuming you're only buying class ones, how many do you need to buy to get to 100? And that's determined by what you count and as what's renewable anyway. Um, and though the, the, an extension of only buying additional class one recs might be and we only want to count the class one recs when we're deciding what counts as 100. Thank you. That's helpful clarification, Paul. Thank you. Andra? Um, yeah, I think that we're, we, we have had discussions in the past um, and you know, for, before even um, you were on the scene, Paul, and um, I think that our communities would balk at our including, you know, something like biomass. So that's the reason why we've always focused on class one recs. Any other questions or comments? Okay, we can move on. Excellent, thank you, Stephanie. So the next question has to do with this local option. And remember we looked at the slide before where we said the aggregation plan says you're definitely gonna have three, standard 100% and basic, and then maybe you'll have local at launch, or maybe you'll add that later. And so I've quoted at the top there what the aggregation plan says about this, um, which is basically that, that you, you know, you're going to have this, op this option, but maybe at launch, maybe not at launch. So one thing we did, Kim and I did, was we asked the potential suppliers if you wanted a local option now at launch, what would the suppliers suggest? And this isn't. This was just um, in the spirit of let's get some ideas. Let's see what they're be, what they're thinking. It's not obviously not obligating you to any of these. And you could, if you any of them are attractive, you could say this is what we want, and then the suppliers would have to bid to that. But this is preliminary to that. Just saying to them, okay, here's a community that might want a local option. If they left it to you, what would you suggest? So we got um, a few suggestions from the suppliers. Um, one said, okay, we'll say that all the additional recs aren't just class one, but they're class one from solar projects in Massachusetts. And they charge an extra premium for that, but that would mean it's all Massachusetts solar. So it's not other New England states. It's not Eastern Canada, it's not New York, it's all Massachusetts and it's all solar. So there's no wind in there. I think we were already planning to exclude the biomass. So that wasn't going to be in there anyway, but it would mean all solar and not, not wind. That's the main difference. That's what one supplier suggested. Another supplier said that, well, we would say that the additional recs will come from projects in or near Valley Green communities to the extent possible but they don't have a big bucket of those recs. So they'd have to go out and look for them. And at this stage, they can't promise how many they would, they would find. A third supplier said, well, we would use what's called the APS, the alternate portfolio standard. And we'd add in recs for that, which is combined heat and power and flywheel storage and efficient steam. 
those projects, and this is the design of the alternate portfolio standard, those are not renewable projects. There are other things that might reduce the need for fossil fuels, but they're not necessarily renewable. Um, and then the fourth supplier said, well, we, we're, we're on board with this idea that it should be about creating new projects, not buying from existing. So they said, well, why doesn't Valley Green charge an adder um, and then give the money to us and we'll promise to use it to create new projects? I don't mean to skew your thinking, but I'll add from my perspective, I had a hard time thinking of why you would do it that way. Why wouldn't you just use the money yourself rather than give it to some supplier and count on them to use it in the way that you thought was optimal, but that's that's just a little commentary uh, commentary for me. Um, and then finally, so the, the alternative is not to have this local project option at launch to say that none of these things seem all that meaningful and instead using the, the adder to really concentrate on developing something that would be truly local and that would be doing more to help build new projects. Um, you know, what we were talking before that would have enhanced um, additionality components to the, as compared to any of these. So that would be an option for you as well, if that's how you want to go forward. So that, that's my intro on this topic. And um, maybe Stephanie makes sense. We just see if there are any questions or comments here. Sure. Anybody, uh, Adele? I forgive me for not remembering this, um, but in our application to DPU, uh, did we include the adder? Yes, you you included the adder number one and number two. Um, the DPU is like right on the cusp of changing all their rules to make it a lot easier to collect the adder and to make it more flexible how you could use it. So. It's in your plan now, and you're about to get more flexibility around that than you had when we wrote the plan. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, Stephanie. Um, I'm, I'm raising my hand. <laughs> Go for it, Tom. I, I mean, just to uh, advance the conversation, um, personally, I'm in favor of the APS idea, but I think it's super complicated and it's not pure renewable, although it could be depending on, you know, how any of the, how the steam is generated, I guess, to be the hardest one. Um, but um, I'm thinking like if we could prioritize these, the second bullet would be the number one priority and then go to the top bullet as number two. Um, and I don't think number four works well, um, and I guess it leads me to think like um, some percentage of the 130, assuming we put it in here, which we've said we're going to, is going to go to fund a person. So that leaves something over, maybe, I think, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but how much are do we actually think, or do we, you know, so how much do we have out of that first mill adder? And then uh, I'm not sure we can answer these questions, but then do we want to, you know, make the adder bigger uh, for the 100% option so that we have the flexibility to do that? But but in simple terms, I'd say bullet number two would be the number one priority for the local option. And I put that out for anybody's comment. Darcy had her hand raised. We can't hear you, Darcy. Sorry, um, I agree with Tom that the second bullet is what we have been talking about and I think was the intention when we wanted a local option. And um, I'm not sure that we have anything to offer right now. Um, I think that, you know, it would be good to get information out there about what we mean about yeah, you know, so that different institutions and programs can start offering RECs to us. Um, 
But so I'm just not clear on whether we have anything to start with. Um, yes, that's all I have to say on that. Ben? So I, I guess if, if we're offering opinions at, at this stage, I'll I'll offer an, an opinion or at least a framework that, that is influencing my thinking, which is one, no, these recs are not additional. And as far as I can tell, the RPS uh, and, and the scarcity of recs is not the primary driver of uh, a, a, of of growth of of renewables uh, facilities that's got more to do with um, uh, interest rates and um, and financing uh, challenges and I could, could be wrong with this but this that's the general framework that I'm thinking from. Two, uh, the biggest single impact that residents could have would be to electrify heating, and that's easier to do the lower the cost of the electricity. Um, so any additional uh, cost for, for your electricity um, should be really, really well justified because it may push some people, especially anyone with access to natural gas, uh, away from electrifying. So that's, again, that's the framework from which I'm thinking. Um, and finally, even if you buy 170% electricity with Rex, on an hourly basis, uh, you're just getting what the grid gives you. And if your demand is part of collective peak demand, then a peaker power plant that's burning God knows what will turn on. Um, so to the degree that we could have additionality, say from a local option that included perhaps in the future storage or the ability to organize a, uh, a virtual power plant, uh, in, in other words, coordinating of uh, all the demand of, of residents, we'd actually have a larger impact on actually reducing uh, the use of fossil fuels on the grid. So that's that's kind of the framework I'm coming from, which pushes me towards the alternative, develop a more robust local option and add it to the program later. And I'm happy to be corrected on any of the assumptions that have undergirded my thinking. <laughs> Adele? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I agree with Ben, uh, and my reasons might be a little bit different. Um, I think that we need to consider the intuitive factor when we're uh, trying to promote um, this local option to our customers. And um, we there are many things to consider. Um, in that discussion. Thank you. Tom? Thank you. Um, I mean, I agree with uh, uh, the, the thought. I think that um, additionality though, Ben, and, and again, I could be wrong, but I think additionality is is a goal, not a gate, so to speak, for this program. And, uh, you know, it's like, um, I think I just want to put a stake in the ground. We have the, the rough outline and at least two options, and we're looking to define the third, which would be the 100% one. This is number four, right? So as far as getting this thing off the ground, which is what I'm thinking about the most, um, nailing down what we're doing on those three options is the first priority, and then figuring out what we do with the local option comes um, after the fact. That makes sense. And I'm going to weigh in as well to say, from my perspective, um, agreeing with Tom that I think, you know, the local option just doesn't seem clear at this point. So the idea of developing some potential projects and investigating those options a little more makes sense to bring in the local option at a future time. Darcy? Darcy, we can't hear you. Um, I'm hoping 
that we put it out there so that it's, you know, coming at some time in the future so that people are aware that it's in the it's in the um plan my feedback on that would also be that that's just part of our education and outreach to discuss a local option that it's coming in the future i think we've always identified having something so that should be part of our education and outreach Other comments or questions on the local option? Okay, thank you all. Paul, you could continue. All right, thank you, Stephanie. Um, so what I have here is I, I just recapped the issues that um, I stated at the beginning. And so it, it might help for, if, if it makes sense to us folks, we could just so to talk quickly, see, make sure we're, we're we're you're hearing correctly what the what the group is thinking to the extent you have consensus on these. Um, I would say um, three of the four are easy. So I think on the first one, the type of additional recs, we didn't talk about this specifically, but it was came up in the discussion. Um, Andrew raised it, for example. You've talked in the past that additional recs should be class one recs. That's the that's been your 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 thinking from the beginning. So unless I hear otherwise, I think that's where the group is on that topic. Um, it will skip the second one for a moment, the 100% green option. It seemed like people are um, thinking pretty much that 100% green should be 100% class ones, that that should be what you're, that that's what you're thinking there. And on the final one, the local option, I think folks are thinking there's not enough clarity yet in what can be offered and also not necessarily enough value in what could be offered now. So best to not offer that at launch, but work hard on it and bring a, a more meaningful local option in for the future. Um, on those three, leaving the that second one for next, did it, it, did I did I hear correctly what folks were thinking on those three points? All right. Um, all right. Let's then talk about that second one: the percentage of additional recs. Um, often, I mean, you're a little bit constrained by, you know, sort of what the prices are and what utility territory you're in. A recommendation that's sometimes offered on this point is to add additional class one recs, or maybe as many, as much additional class one recs as you can, while keeping the price below the basic service price. That would be one, that's one common recommendation. Um, I don't know if that matches what you're thinking, if some would think it's worth going above basic service. Or Ben, to your point earlier, whether it's you would argue, maybe think it should be even be more conservative on that to keep the the price impacts down. Well, you summarized my point of view. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm on board with that. I think the goal is to get people in in. So anything that can reduce friction there uh, seems like a good idea for launch. So I think maybe we could um, even put a finer point on it. Let me go back to that slide because this is really the toughest one. So assuming the numbers look like this and assuming we get your adder in that 13.5 cent price, you could go with 10% and be under basic service by a smidge, or you could go with 5% and say, you know, keep the price a little lower, but you're offering less in the way of additional renewables. I'm just gonna jump in and say my inclination would be for us to be going with the 10%. Darcy? Darcy, we can't hear you. Um, I 
I agree with Stephanie. Um, uh, I think partly because, you know, we've seen the process of the other communities coming up with their additional percentages. And I would think that we would fall more toward the higher percentages considering how innovative we're trying to make this program. Um, so, and it, and the national grid um, would, I, I guess I'm not totally clear that, that, that uh, the national grid people would say more money than the Wumiko would. If we can, if we were at ten percent, or in any event, and Ben, I I mean that that sounds right. Obviously, speaking from the national grid side of this conversation, we've got a lot more flexibility. You know, like we could, we could go higher and and still offer a really good rate. Um, you know, obviously, I I think we should want to encourage or we want to save as much money as possible for the Wamiko uh, territory people as well. Um, if 13.5 was the base price, and again, we don't have the actual bids, but if that is what it was, as a principle, I would say 10% looks pretty good, right? It's it's staying below the Wamiko one and it's giving uh, a pretty strong encouragement towards electrification in my that <laughs> my framing anyway for um uh, for the national grid one um you know again all depends on the actual bids right um anybody else Pel pelham agrees i mean <laughs> uh as long as we have the 13.5 uh, um you know it's there's just all these stories about, you know, how, um, you know, people that are well employed can do things that people who are struggling more can't. And I think the Pelham, not not universally, but I think that there's more uh, economic uh, stratification in Pelham, maybe. But but I think the, the base option um, addresses that and uh, going with the additional is is uh, a good idea for the for the next level. The 10 percent. All right. I mean, thank you. I think that's a that's a pretty clear direction. It sounds to me like it's keep the price below the Wamiko basic service price and you know target 10% additional class ones if if as you know as, as long as you can do that under the Wamiko price. Um and then um I hadn't put this on the agenda, but uh, a point Tom made earlier causes me to think it might make sense to raise it. So in terms of the amount of the adder, we had put one mil in the plan, but also said in the plan that the communities will make the final decision on the adder rate as part of accepting bids. So we have flexibility to modify that amount. Um, there was a lot of discussion with the local option you know, wanting to do something more meaningful there and the adder funds would really be the you know essential to that and also that you know, the plan was to hopefully use the adder funds to help cover a staff person as well or the costs of river valley green so i wanted to ask whether this group was um thought that if if the numbers come together and they may not but that going a little higher with the adder, if that can be squeezed in, might be a useful thing to give you more to work with for that, um, for that local option. Darcy? You have to unmute. Um, are you asking um, whether we could have more than one mil adder? Um, so we, we just had local energy advocates just had, um, Megan Shaw from Cambridge come and talk to us and she, you know, they, their aggregation plan has a two mil ladder. Um, and so is that something that's still possible post approval by DPW or how does that work? 
Yeah, so exactly right. So the the, the question I, I was trying to ask was whether this group would favor that, whether it's possible, I'd say, yes, it is, because the way we wrote the plan, as we said, one mil, but you'll make the final decision once you see the bid prices. So the you would have flexibility to go with a higher amount and that's your you know the the community's decisions to make so i was i was wanting to see what this whether this group had a perspective on that question if it was if there was room for it in the prices tom uh, i guess the only thing i'd so um we're gonna when are we gonna i'm just trying to get the timeline straight now paul when are we going to get the uh the the, the bids back yeah, so I think the timing, uh, Stephanie, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we'll have in, indicative bids, which are non-binding bids from the suppliers, but they're still they're confidential bids because um, the communities don't want the suppliers' bids to get out because then they'll see what each other's bidding, which would which would weaken your bargaining position. So the, the executive group will be looking at those non-binding bids later this week. And then I think we take final bids the week after. So mm -hmm. it's within the next, you know, 10, within the next two, like week and a half, the whole thing should, will be final. Well, two, two things then, um, you know, one is, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, once we get the indicative bids, we then have a better sense of just how much, like, like to put two mills on this, you know, everybody's still, you know, above board, right? It's 13.7 for the Wamiko folks versus the 14.02. Um, the other thing is we probably, uh, again, not today, but we probably need to put a document together um, as to how we want to spend, how we propose that money is going to be spent between administering the program and creating a fund to invest in new projects, um, footnoting that for the future. Not not too distant future, it sounds like. Can I ask a, another oh. question? Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Ben. Um, so uh, it, it, how locked in are we to the one mill or the two mill? Uh, so because one thought I have is as prices change out in the market, this is a small little tool that we can use to essentially uh, s smooth out those peaks and valleys um, at, with in a kind of unnoticeable way to the customer. And that means as prices lower, we can actually get a little bit more investment capital. And as prices rise, we can cushion the blow. Is that possible? Um, so that's an, that's an interesting question. It is literally possible in the sense that um, the 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 community's contract with the supplier will innate, will authorize you to allow you to change that adder amount twice a year. Um, you can't change it all the time because they have to sure. submit a rate change to the utility and it's a big complicated thing. But you'll have the, the legal authority to do it twice a year. The countervailing thing, though, is that you need in your notice to customers to tell them what the price is and for how long that will be the price. And one of the values of aggregation is that they have stable pricing. So typically the way it works is you'll decide what you want and it will be that for the term, um, let's say two years as an example. So you could tweak it, but then you'd have to say, this is our price, but it's only our price for six months. Six months from now, it might we might move it up a little, might move it down a little, which you could do, but it would um, un undercut one of the things that's typically seen as the value of an aggregation you know, compared to basic service, which does change every six months. But if you're managing it for the purpose of actually increasing stability, that again, that goes to that document uh, that Tom's talking about. Yeah, yeah. So it would you could you could um, be more constant relative to basic service by moving that amount up and down. That's true, and it's also true, you're still moving your price up and down, so you'd have to tell people you're gonna move your price up and down. Andra? Um, <clears throat> I hope this isn't repeating, but my sense of our um, intention 
is to be innovative. And so we would go with um, a two mil adder um, rather than increase the percentage of voluntary class one recs had, you know, when, when we see the actual bids, that would be my, my sense, um, just to be clear. And, and I don't want to prolong this, but I want to ask the hard question. So what if you could have 5% and two mils or 10% and one mil? My sense is we'd still go with the 10% and see if we can squeeze in a two mil. <laughs> And and is it fair to say, and I, I think this is consistent with what folks said before, that 10% feels like a threshold to be offering something that's kind of in line with the other communities that are serious. So you, you need to be there. And then if you can bump up the adder a little bit, great. You don't need to go to 15%, happy at 10. But, don't, but under 10 is feeling like it's not you know, significant enough. I would say that's accurate. Adele? I would like to uh, offer a contrary opinion that um, in our education of the community, we could make sure that people understand that the rationale is to increase the local option that is yet to be developed um, and that that would appeal to our community. So therefore, um, the lower additional RECs, the 5%, but the higher adder is what I would uh, go for. I would just counter Adele and throw in there that my concern is the opportunity for the local development. So I'm I'm not sure exactly what the real possibilities are. So I would still myself feel more comfortable going with the higher percentage. That's just my take. If, if it's as Paul describes that you've got the ability to adjust this periodically then I would be inclined to stick with Stephanie's take in terms of introducing a product where you don't have something on offer right away to say, oh, here's what your adder is going to be used for. Be secure in that. It's like, no, we're getting, we're getting you these class one recs, but over time, as say that one, one mil adder helps fund a person to do the research to develop the project that becomes the local object uh, op option, then it's there's the ability to change it. And it's for something that you can explain to people because it's got, it's closer to reality. Um, does that, do I have the changeability correct? You certainly, yes. So you certainly do. So as I said, you need to tell people how long it's going to be in effect. But if you decided to change that midway, you just need to tell people. So we said it was going to be effective for two years, but we're changing it for these reasons. And not that this is going to happen, but there are external reasons that can also cause a change in price. Like, you know, there's a you know, nuclear plant goes down or something and the cost of electricity triples or something. So actually, that may not be a good example, but there, 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 are, there are other things that could happen. So, yes, yeah, so there's an obligation to explain if you're going to change, but you can change. I mean, that's yeah. this plan goes down, Paul. That's what you meant to say. <laughs> um, yeah, because, uh, you know, there is the, there's a political worry that I would have about the idea of a cabal collecting money to spend on something they want, right? I'm just, I'm, I'm just imagining how other people might uh, create a story about this, <laughs> this thing. And, and you want to really be, 
you want to really have your explanation well in hand. And as Adele said, it's about customer education. So kind of having that well developed seems important. Darcy, you can unmute. Um, I just want to say that I um, I am so excited that we're even talking about a two mil ad. Or we it's been a you know we've been we have been hoping for something like that since the beginning, and I, I didn't even really think it was a possibility. So I get what you're saying, Ben, about thinking thinking that you know we would be we would have to explain why we were hoarding our money uh, for future projects. But, um, I, you know, I think it's only Cambridge is doing that to my knowledge. Is that correct, Paul? And Cambridge is our, you know, our model of innovation. Um, so uh, I'm all for two mil ladder. Tom? Yeah, um, I think I think we're all all for it. I think um, what what Ben's point in particular, but also Adele's, um, until we like we have to go back and tell people why we're raising at one mil, right? Is to put a person to work to support this. So, um, uh, especially you know f folks in the public service side of this, uh, Ben and Stephanie um, have have support so that this doesn't become just another job. But beyond that, I think. Going in low is going to be very helpful to getting participation. Participation is what's going to drive our ability in the future um, to do these kind of things. Um, I, I have a lot of, like, my, my experience is it's not easy. To, we're, we're talking about using this money to develop projects. It's not easy. Um, you get involved, you know, we'd have to find a developer to work with. Anyhow, I don't want to go into it too much. I'm just in favor of going with the 10% keeping the adder at one mil for now, given the flexibility we have. Um, and uh, that that's, I, I don't know if we're voting. I'm just putting my opinion out there right now, I guess. Thanks, Tom. And that goes to my concern earlier um, that I expressed, which was what is the potential for development and that it's not easy. So that's why I'm sort of cautioning the more careful long-term well thought out approach as to how we discuss, you know, doing the local option and um, and dealing with the adder as well. Other comments? Okay. Oh, go ahead, Tom. All right, Stephanie. I just was going to say I pretty much have a hard stop in the next four minutes or so, so um, I want to make sure, sure that I. Uh, hear anything that needs to be said before I check out. Okay. Well, this is being recorded, so you'll all make sure you will you get the link. But um, if there, do you have any uh, particular question that you wanted to ask before you need to go? Um, no. I mean, we've raised a whole bunch of issues. I think we've gotten resolution on the core ones. Um, I guess, how do we, where do we as a group go? How does this meeting feed into the meeting with the executive committee on Thursday? Um, would be, I guess, the most important one. Um, yep. Well, I think I think what we want to do um, is maybe have a uh, another meeting. We'll schedule another meeting. Hold on one second. Let me just grab my calendar here. Um, if we can squeeze one in. If we could maybe do next Monday, wait, sorry, let me double check here. So there, that meeting is the 16th. So I think there's an executive kind of similar session to this one on Thursday, but I think if we can have a meeting maybe Friday of this week, um, and pull our thoughts together to get to that we can share with the executives before next Tuesday. Does that sound like a good strategy, Paul? 
Um, that's certainly fine as far as as far as we're concerned, Stephanie. So, do folks are folks available on Friday, nine ten? Tom, you're often the one who has a, yeah, a hard schedule. I'm, I'm not even. I'm going to be in the air all day on Friday. Um, and don't we have an executive meeting on Thursday? Yes, but that's the executive, so that's not the whole group. So I, what I'm saying is the whole group. I mean, the whole group could, you know, we could meet on Wednesday. Would Wednesday work for you, Tom? Um, it could. Why don't I send out a doodle poll after this meeting instead of trying to figure this out right now? Okay. I'll send a doodle poll and we'll try to figure it out. Before. I'm just trying to get us to convene before next Tuesday the 16th. I don't think we have to convene necessarily before this Thursday. I think we just need to make sure we convene before the 16th. So I'll pull, I'll put a doodle poll out right after this meeting. Sounds great. Um, to, before Tom goes, I just want to ask, will um, the representatives from each municipality be um, giving the executives an update on what we think the recommendations <laughs> that's the point them. that's the point of the next meeting is we're going to try to put something together so that it's like done collectively as a group and then we can get it we can share it darcy um could um could we get a link to your slideshow today paul so i can put it in the minutes and we can have it would that be okay? Absolutely. All right. Yeah, we need that for, as part of the public record anyway. Yeah, that's actually helpful. I, I'd like to ask your permission to uh, use it as part of my discussion with the Northampton Energy and Sustainability Commission, because I want to just report out to them where things stand on this and, and get their input. Um, yes, let me... Um, Paul, if you just send it to me, I'll send them out to the group. Yeah, so I'll send it to Stephanie and then let Stephanie circulate it around. But yes, it was this was designed as a public presentation. So you're free as far as we're concerned to use it. Um, and Thanks. We'll just ask you, you emphasize, and we said it on the slides, but they're not actual prices, they're illustrations. So. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. So are we, uh, we are completed with that presentation. We do have public comment and we do have a few members uh, as attendees. So if there's anyone who is in as an attendee and would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Okay, there are no questions, so. Um, so, Paul, thank you as always. We'll look to get that those slides from you and I'll send them out to the group. I will send a doodle poll to the group for us to convene a meeting uh, sometime this week. Um, and then we can put together our recommendations to the executives before their bid meeting on the 16th. Sound good? All right. Thank you all so much for your time. And again, I so appreciate your patience and my sincere apologies. It's been a little whirlwind. <laughs> so thanks, everybody. Thanks, Stephanie. Right. Thank you, Stephanie. Bye.